My friend Kelsey Hightower once said, containers are the price of admission to using Kubernetes. So to get started with Kubernetes, we'll need to dive deeper into what containers really are. With a whole universe of things to learn, it's important to start with the essentials. Let's go over the concepts that make Kubernetes usable, scalable, and just downright awesome. Are you ready? So Kubernetes is a container orchestrator. Last time you said that containers were packaged up services, what does that actually mean? Yeah, containers were built to deploy smaller services with isolation and consistency. But they're not actually a new concept. Containers are based on some underlying concepts from the Linux kernel, namespaces and C groups. Right. Namespaces make sure that individual processes can't see the details of other processes. And C groups control how much resources a process can use, like CPU and memory. These two concepts are all about giving a process isolation protecting it from interfering with other processes, as well as protecting itself from others. <laughs> Virtual machines can give a similar level of isolation, but only by packing the whole operating system with it. For plenty of applications, the OS isn't necessary and it certainly takes up a lot of resources. Containers, on the other hand, only focus on the application and its dependencies, making them more lightweight. Now, apps don't need to worry about if some developer had hard-coded Python 2.7 into the path variable. That's an oddly specific example, but yes. There's actually a few different container runtimes, but one of the most popular is Docker. They built an API that helped app developers build containers, and a platform to run them the same way regardless of which machine they run on. Right, it's all about letting the app developer define what they want the runtime to look like instead of spending time messing around with the kernel. This is all done in a Docker file. Hmm. Why don't we zoom in on one? Good idea. If you were working on a simple Flask app, your Docker file might look like this. The first line is the base image the app should use. You can choose from all sorts of base images. So you can choose one that has exactly what you need with less overhead, making your container smaller. Next, these lines tell the container what commands to run when being initialized. Your Flask app is definitely going to need Python, so this installs Python, pip, and Flask. Now the copy command will grab files from your local environment and copy them into the container. So your local app.py file gets copied to slash opt slash app.py. And the container now has your app files. And finally, the entry point command lets your container run as an executable actually starting up the Flask application. With just a few lines, you've created a container. Awesome. But, but but you would still have to manually deploy the container, manage it, and handle situations like if the container goes down or if you want to roll out an upgrade to your app code. And now we've come back to Kubernetes. Kubernetes takes care of managing your containers, no matter if you have one or a thousand. Just like how your Docker file explains what you want your container to do, you can configure Kubernetes for what you want your whole cluster to do. You, you might hear this called the desired state. And that's probably the coolest thing about Kubernetes. You tell it what the desired state for the cluster is, and it automates everything from pods, nodes, load balancers, and more. Whoa, uh, hold on, that's a lot of new stuff. Let's start with the essentials. We were just talking about containers. So what's a pod? A pod is like a collection of multiple containers, sort of a pseudo application. It could just be one app, or it could be multiple different ones that need to work together. For example, let's go back to your Flask app. Okay, so I know how to build a container. How do we turn this into a pod? Well, if that's your desired state, we can tell Kubernetes to make it happen. Here's a YAML file that gives the desired state for a pod. This metadata section gives a way for Kubernetes to group pods and other resources together, and we'll dive deeper into that later. For now, the key part is this spec section. Here's where you name the pod and tell it which image to use. Since this is a simple pod, your container is the only one running here. There's also a port section so the container can be accessed through the web on the default HTTP port 80. Once this config is put into a Kubernetes cluster, Kubernetes knows what you want to do and is in charge of ensuring that your actual state matches your desired state. That's a great start. Uh, but where is the pod actually going to run? For that, we'll need to talk more about nodes and deployments. Let's cover that in the next episode. Sounds good. So today we covered more about containers and why they became so popular. Then we started to talk about how Kubernetes works with containers, but there's still plenty more to cover. 
Wow, that was a lot of great info on containers, but now we need to figure out how they run. Okay. Stay tuned, everybody. If you want to get hands-on, check out the link in the description. And if you enjoyed the episode, subscribe for more.